Uh, Professor Hannan and his colleagues um, many years ago were the first group in the world to demonstrate that environmental enrichment could have disease-modifying effects in genetically inherited diseases, like Huntington's disease. And Tony has, con has continued this work um, for the next decade, and he is intimately involved in looking at all aspects of environmental enrichment and brain plasticity. And this is what he's going to be talking to you about today, the interplay of your environment and your genetics to influence your brain health. So without further ado, please welcome Professor Anthony Hannon. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. So to introduce what I'm going to talk to today, uh, I firstly want to share with you the, the range of brain and mind disorders, neurological and psychiatric disorders that we're working on at the Flora Institute. So if you go through this list, autism spectrum disorder, Alzheimer's, dementia, depression, epilepsy, Huntington's, motor neuron disease, uh, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or manic depression, anxiety disorders, addiction, stroke, TBI, uh, and others. I would pose the question to you if you think about whether you directly or a family member or a friend has been affected by at least one of these, and I'd ask everyone in that position to raise a hand. So this is, this is quite extraordinary, and it's really, you can imagine it's a national crisis or emergency in, in this situation, because the vast majority of those are either totally untreatable or poorly treated for the majority of sufferers. And so this is an, an urgent priority and something that uh, we at the Flory think uh, should be a priority and, and to push towards prevention, treatment and eventual cure of all of these brain disorders is our major focus. The statistics, not just in Australia, but around the world are quite shocking when you think about uh, these numbers worldwide, uh, that it's 25% of the total burden of disease, which is not just mortality or death, it's suffering, and some of these brain disorders that strike early um, produce suffering for the individuals and their families for a lifetime. So th the stats that 75% will suffer from a brain or mind condition in their lifetime is also quite a, a shocking statistic. So I, I'd put that context there for you to uh, think about in terms of this as an, an ongoing priority. Okay, now getting to the science. What we've been interested in, as Tom mentioned, is understanding how genes and environment contribute to risks of particular brain disorders. So ultimately that's what we are, where the origins of our genes, our genome, and its interaction with the environment over a lifetime, from conception through to old age. Well, I'll mention at the end, we're starting to look at how the environment might actually change you via your parents and grandparents. Uh, I'll mention that later on. So uh, this is one of the things we really need to understand, this combination of genes and environment and how it predisposes some to a particular brain disorder and how it actually makes some people resilient to a particular brain disorder. So in terms of what we'll talk about, we've been focusing uh, on Huntington's disease as one of these major brain disorders. Uh, but as I mentioned at the Flory, many of these other brain disorders are also a focus and, and include more complex genetics and complex environmental factors we don't really understand. And uh, you can see other disorders worked on at the Flory like stroke, which are perhaps down, more down the environment end of this scale than, say, Huntington's caused by a single gene mutation. But ultimately, our work and the work of others suggests all brain disorders have a different mix of a genes and environment. There is no brain disorder that's 100% genetic or 100% environmental. We're interested in understanding how particular important environmental factors uh, are at play, particularly cognitive stimulation, physical activity, stress, and uh, we're just starting to look at diet as uh, another environmental factor. Okay, so let's get back to the basics here. Everything you think, everything you feel, every movement you make has its origins in this kilogram and a half of soft gray and white tissue residing in your skulls. There is not anything else. As a neuroscientist, I don't believe in dualism. Everything is generated within 
your brains. And that itself is quite extraordinary, the fact that uh, you can do that. My grandmother actually lived to 101. She had what were called mini strokes uh, very late, but in, into her late 90s, she was really uh, sharp as a tack before she had that dementia associated with these strokes. And I remember uh, my grandmother recalling things that had happened to her when she was just five or six years old. And she had carried these detailed memories, this information around in her brain for almost 95 years. And when I give talks to undergraduates and they're all up on there on their phones and their laptops and their tablet devices, and I say to them, that device, you probably get nothing sensible out of that device in five years' time. And yet my grandmother carried around incredibly complex memories and information for 95 years. And that in itself is, is quite extraordinary. There are many extraordinary things about the brain. And what you can see here is the result of research using a form of brain imaging called magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. And, and Flory neuroscientists are world leaders in uh, this field and others. So essentially, it's the age of human brain with brain imaging. You recognize down the bottom is looking down on your brain from the top, and up here is looking from the side, from the ages of five to 20. And what this is showing in this animation down the bottom, as it shifts from the red, green, yellow to blue, uh, the predominantly blue is 20 years of age, the later age. And what this reflects is that between the ages of five and 20, the brain has been sculpted by experience. It's a thinning of the cortex, uh, including these synapses or connections. And your experience, your environment, and your engagement with it sculpts the brain during these critical periods from five to 20. But there's evidence that it doesn't actually stop at 20. Areas of the brain, such as the prefrontal cortex, that are very important for um, key aspects of cognition, including planning and, and higher order thoughts, they're thought to be changing structurally even into the mid-20s, uh, but also at, at a microstructural level. Our brains continue to change throughout life. If you remember anything from this lecture, the evidence is that connections in your brain will have changed to encode that information. And as you leave this lecture theatre, your brain will be structurally different from when you entered. So the brain's a mind machine. As I said, everything we think and feel and do is uh, occurring within here. And here's some of the complexity. There's over 100 billion neurons, or approximately 100 billion neurons. And it's thought to be a similar number of what are called glia, these cells, these other type of cells in the brain that aren't neurons. And these neurons are connected by approximately 1,000 trillion synapses. So there's extraordinary complexity here. And this is partly what we're trying to understand. We do want to understand how the brain generates thoughts and emotions and movement, uh, and how that goes wrong in these range of brain disorders that I showed on the earlier slide. So the study of the brain goes back many centuries, uh, including right back to uh, Franz Joseph Gall. And he was the creator of phrenology. Back, back in the day when you couldn't study the brain, uh, they, they studied the bumps on the outside of the, the skull. And uh, he set up this um, field now debunked that tried to relate the bumps on the skull to uh, different capacities. Uh, when my colleague Emma Burrows generated the slide, it was two years ago, I actually gave this talk. <laughs> it was the day he was elected. <laughs> and the crowd was in shock. <laughs> People were just kind of, <laughs> they were in complete shock. Uh, so I promise no more. <laughs> No more Trump. <laughs> OK, so what I tell uh, the students at the University of Melbourne that we teach is that doing neuroscience in the early 21st century is like doing physics was in the early 20th century. Brain science is the great frontier of the 21st century. And more generally, biomedical science is a great frontier as we have the genome and many other technologies that are going to transform medicine through prevention, uh, precision medicine, 
personalised medicine and, and medicine will be completely transformed uh, in the decades ahead. So getting back to this brain imaging, what you're looking now, as you can imagine, is side on through the skull. And again, this is this MRI technique showing a structural view of the brain sitting within the skull. And as I mentioned, uh, colleagues at the Flory have pioneered different methods to be able to study the structural wiring that occurs within the brain with cutting edge versions of this MRI technology. So the, the first revolution is the idea, going back many decades, it was thought that the brain, when it reached adulthood, was fixed. It was like a supercomputer, and it was fixed, and that was it. And uh, neurons could die, and the computer could wear out, but it, it was somewhat fixed. And in recent decades, uh, it's been found that the brain remains plastic. It remains responsive to the environment, not just during development, but throughout life. And this knowledge is, is empowering in terms of how we might harness that to prevent, to treat and cure these brain disorders that I mentioned. So one of the forms of plasticity is actually that which mediates learning and memory, which is just so essential uh, to being a functional human. And obviously, failure of memory is a key aspect of various brain disorders, including Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of dementia and, and a major focus of work at the Flory Institute. So in this image, as I mentioned, this technology which Flory colleagues have contributed to is showing actually the bundles of nerves or axons as they traverse the brain and connect the brain with the spinal cord and the rest of the body in this complex bidirectional interplay. So we know that with learning, there are changes that occur within the brain. And this has been demonstrated in many different ways, including a uh, classic study of taxi drivers in London, where they learned the knowledge, all of these back before GPS, back before uh, you know, smartphones, back when you actually had to encode this knowledge in, in the brain. And it, they showed that a particular part of the brain called the hippocampus as these taxi drivers learned all of this spatial information, they could see changes, uh, enlargement of this part of the brain called the hippocampus. And there's been various other studies. I'll give another example uh, that's quite dramatic. Uh, firstly, this is just showing when I mentioned brain imaging, so the two major techniques. I mentioned MRI and another major technique being uh, used heavily at the Flory is called positron emission tomography or PET. And this is a different approach, but importantly, it allows the visualization of toxic proteins in the brain, such as amyloid and tau, which we think are particularly important for Alzheimer's disease, but other proteins related to Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, and motor neuron disease can potentially be viewed with these type of cutting edge imaging techniques. So this was a study. Um, as I was leaving Oxford, colleagues there would, were really pushing this MRI technology, and this was a study that came out of there, one of the early studies. And what they did was they recruited undergraduate students, which probably weren't necessarily typical, but they all had to have never juggled before. That was the one condition, is that they, they'd all never juggled. And then they, in scan one, which is not being shown, they all learnt to juggle. They were trained to juggle. Well, actually, half of them, sorry, half of them were trained. You always have to have controls in proper experiments. So the controls didn't learn to juggle. The jugglers obviously learned to juggle. And this is a structural uh, scan, again, up here looking down from the, on the top of your head and here looking in the side. And the striking thing about this was even this short period of weeks led to structural changes in the brain and those that had learned to juggle that were visible on this uh, type of brain scan. So the, the learning of juggling was imprinted in a way in the brain that could be visualised even with this uh, reasonably simple form of, of brain imaging. And when they had them stop juggling for a number of weeks afterwards, the, the physical strength changes were still there. The structural changes persisted, suggesting that they were associated with this long-term learning of the ability to juggle. OK, so moving now on to this second revolution, which goes obviously beyond neuroscience and brain disorders, and will also transform 
all of our lives. And so you're aware that your genome consists of uh, three billion letters of DNA or pairs, uh, base pairs of DNA. And uh, this was sequenced almost two decades ago now. But that's really just a starting point because we're a lot of research, including that at the Flory, is trying to work out uh, these over 20,000 genes within there, this complexity, what it means, how it affects your predisposition to disease, how it affects uh, who you are and what you look like uh, and how you live, and in some cases, how you might die if we're unable to prevent or, or treat these disorders. So one interest of ours is actually, uh, and facilitated by this new technology, is that uh, the genome is very complex and it has many genetic stutters within it, bits of DNA that just repeat again and again. And in the past, some of this DNA was referred to as junk DNA. It just appeared to be evolution had thrown up these stutters and junk DNA and it, it's repeating so it can't be important. And in recent decades, increasingly, we've found these genetic stutters, these repeating pieces of DNA seem to be uh, very important. And these technologies allow you not just to sequence a human genome, but the genomes of many, many species. The ultimate goal is if there's 10 million species on the planet, that we could have the genome sequence of every single one, because the costs of DNA sequencing are dropping. That, that would be the ultimate goal. And it allows you to see that these genetic stutters occurred early in evolution and have been preserved and are clearly doing a number of very important things. So I'm going to move now on to uh, a disease caused by one of these genetic stutters, uh, this DNA mutation, and we've done a lot of work in this area. But firstly, this is, I was talking about genes, we're now combining that with the concept of environment, how, how that combines in disorders like Huntington's, but also Alzheimer's and other brain disorders. This was George Huntington who first described the disease in 1872. So this disease struck one of the great American folk singers, uh, Woody Guthrie, who was the hero and inspiration for Bob Dylan, who's recently toured Australia, uh, and I'm a big fan of, of Bob Dylan. So this was uh, from lyrics from Huntington's Career Blues by Woody Guthrie. Uh, so smoking didn't kill Woody, it was Huntington's that killed uh, Woody. And you can see in the lyrics here, I got this thing called career in my head, want to walk but I fall down instead. Folks say Woody, he's just drunk again, but I haven't had a drink since I don't know when. Besides, I only drink when I'm alone or with somebody. My arms felt funny moving all the time and sometimes my head didn't feel like mine. Kept telling myself it was a Ballantyne ale and them jugs of wine on the riding trail. I prefer a disease that you can sober up from. So uh, Bob Dylan visited Woody on his deathbed as uh, Huntington's has racked his brain and body over uh, two decades. And so uh, he, he'd visited him and then he wrote the lyrics in this song. Um, hey, hey, Woody Guthrie, I wrote you a song about a funny old world that's coming along. It's sick and it's hungry, it's tired and it's torn. Looks like it's dying and it's hardly been born, which could probably be written today if he wanted to, to write another song. So that's the background. Uh, and Huntington's is caused by this genetic starter. And that's another thing that makes it extraordinary, these type of genetic diseases. So I don't know if anyone in the audience is from a Huntington's family. If you're not, I, if neither of your parents have um, had Huntington's, then in your gene, this repeat, which is three letters of DNA, C, A, and G, and at the level of a protein encodes a single amino acid called the glutamine. And so in your gene, if it's not in your family, you have about 10 to 35 of these in a row. And the only thing that will distinguish you from someone who will die horribly of Huntington's, because we don't just have, yet have a treatment, is that they'll generally have 40 or more in their gene. And so this is encoding these glutamines in a protein that's over 3,000 of these amino acids long in the protein. And uh, that number 40 is sitting 
in a genome, as I said, that's over three billion letters of DNA. So it's an extraordinarily fine line between life and death in this type of genetic disorder. It's also a particularly horribly um, devastating disorder because it has this triad of symptoms. It has obviously what George Huntington first described is this movement disorder. So it often presents as these writhing dance-like movements. Uh, and we know it's been around for a long time. They used to call it St. Vitus Dance hundreds of years ago. And some of these poor people ended up in circuses where they used them for entertainment because they had this uncontrollable dance-like movement. So that was the only way they could actually eke out a living before they died of this uh, disease. But with time, uh, we've been able to see that it also has cognitive deficits, which culminate in a form of dementia, which is different from Alzheimer's dementia, but it is a form of dementia. And they have psychiatric symptoms, uh, the most common of which is depression. And our work at the Flory pioneered this area where we were able to show in a mouse model of Huntington's that we can model the depression in the mice, which is a key factor because there's an argument if you're from a family like a Huntington's family, there are psychological reasons why you might suffer depression that are separate from the gene. But the mice don't know they have the gene mutation and they showed behavioural changes which re responded to antidepressant anti drugs that suggest that the gene and the mutation is increasing predisposition to depression from within the brain. And as I said, uh, it uh, usually kills patients within 10 to 20 years, but then 5% of cases have juvenile onset and it kills them much more quickly. So back to these genetic stutters. Here's Huntington's disease as one group, and this is quite a large group of disorders, and they particularly uh, affect the brain and the rest of the nervous system. We're still trying to work out why, because these genes seem to be very widely expressed in the body, but there's a, a specific vulnerability to the brain and particular cells in the brain. That's one of the things we're trying to work out. So there's Huntington's sitting here. We're also starting to work with colleagues at the Flory on uh, another gene called c 9 f 72 which is a major contributor to motor neuron disease, uh, also called ALS, and frontotemporal dementia. So I mentioned that these uh, CAGs that encode these glutamines, and that's uh, the cause, the expansion's the cause of Huntington's. So when that happens, uh, if you look at, again, this is a cartoon of the brain side on, and you can look at the brain at post-mortem where someone's donated the brain, and these ventricles, these holes aren't normally that big, so it reflects all this tissue in the brain that's degenerated around here, making these, these huge holes within the brain and also shrinkage of the whole cerebral cortex, which is shown here, uh, the, the areas of the brain, including the cerebral cortex and parts of the basal ganglia that are particularly affected. All right, so we, in order to understand these diseases, to understand the mechanism and to uh, eventually develop treatments, we need animal models. And you can't do this in a dish. We have colleagues at the Flory working on um, stem cells, on these iPS cells, uh, inducible pluripotent stem cells in dish, and that's uh, very useful work. But cells in a dish don't have cognition, they don't have emotions, and they can't move. And therefore, in order to understand diseases and to eventually treat them, we do need animal models. Now, our colleagues uh, have developed a transgenic sheep model of Huntington's. There's recently a transgenic pig model. There is no goat model of Huntington's. But like most of biomedical research, uh, the main model we've used is mice. Uh, so mice are mammals like us. Their genomes are over 95% similar to ours. They have the same kind of brain regions, much smaller brains, but they have um, circuits that we can relate to the human brain. And so one of the things we did, uh, the first experiments we did with these mice was to look at the effect of environment on these mice. And until we did these first experiments, uh, it was considered that Huntington's, even in textbooks, was 100% genetic, the epitome of genetic determinism. Uh, and this was a lesson to me in that uh, if we tried to write a grant to a government body to do this research, we would never have got the grant because it was paradigm shifting, it was unorthodox, uh, and no one would have funded it. 
So uh, we had to find a way to go and do these experiments without um, government funding, and that's what we did. So just back to what's changing here. The mice in a, in a normal cage will have, you only have males or females, we don't want them breeding because that confounds the research, but they'll have soft bedding, other mice, unlimited food and water, but it'll be a bit boring. What we call environmental enrichment is increasing novelty and complexity, sensory stimulation, cognitive stimulation, and opportunities for physical activity. And this was the first experiment actually done with my first PhD student, Anton van Dellen. And what we found was that this is just a graph showing what's important here. Wild type means control mice that don't have the Huntington's mutation and they never develop Huntington's, so they never develop this movement disorder. Those in the standard housing, the very boring um, cages, by five months of age, as expected, they developed these movement disorder modelling career. But those that received environmental enrichment had a dramatic delay in onset of the movement disorder modelling uh, career in Huntington's disease. All right, so uh, from that, we also wanted to explore other aspects of Huntington's disease, including the cognitive problems, culminating in dementia, and also modelling the psychiatric problems such as depression. So mice, you'll be surprised at what, they can't do crosswords, but they can do some pretty complex stuff. And so I'm going to play you a video now. This is work that's been pioneered uh, in my group by Emma Burrows over the last five years, but also Jess Nithi and Antharaja. Um, we recruited her back a number of years ago, and Jess's group has also been doing some lovely touchscreen work. So have a look at the, on the left side initially here. Um, so you can see it touching the screen and then coming back it gets a strawberry milk reward there. This, these mice, okay? So this is like an iPad at the front of the chamber, a tablet device and the visual stimuli are presented on that screen and the mouse touches its nose and this time the light came on so the mouse already knew not to look for the strawberry milk reward because uh, when the light comes on, uh, that means it's got it wrong and it knows by after training that it's got it wrong. I can show you that once more. Have a look, have a look here. It gets it right and then it gets uh, some strawberry milk at the back of the chamber, which they really love. And so, uh, whereas this one gets it wrong and on this side and doesn't get the strawberry milk. So the important thing, there we go, wrong answer, no reward. So the important thing about this is that uh, it actually relates to human tests, neuropsychology tests that will be used on subjects. If, if you or one of your family members has to go to a clinical neuropsychologist, they might, you might have this type of computer screen, tablet device equivalent and have to do these tasks and they're uh, totally equivalent tasks. Uh, so, Jess Smithy and Antharaja with Seth Grant and other colleagues, um, Jess was able to show that this is indeed translatable. Uh, it wasn't work done at the Flory, but it's been work that's uh, been brought back to the Flory and is actively being done here now. So essentially, this is showing a gene mutation in one gene. It's not really important. It controls these connections or synapses between neurons. And as I said, humans are very closely related to mice, so uh, the vast majority of our genes, um, except for about 300 that are present in the mouse genome, are present in our genome. And this is one of them, so it's the equivalent gene in the human genome that's in the mouse genome. And when that gene is mutated in the mice, they have problems with these cognitive tasks, including aspects of learning and memory, what's called cognitive flexibility or adaptability and attention. And the humans with this mutation, who happen to have um, cognitive problems associated with schizophrenia, they showed parallel cognitive problems on this parallel task. The important thing is here, if we have a, a new potential treatment for a brain disorder like schizophrenia or Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia, and we trial it in these cognitive touchscreen chambers and it works, when it's taken into clinical trials, using directly equivalent translatable technology, the drug or other therapeutic is more likely to work. And that's our focus. How do we improve our neuroscience and our tests 
to make these things more likely to translate in clinical trials. This was uh, work that Jess actually did previously when she was in my lab, and, and this is a different type of cognitive task without a touch screen where the mouse is released uh, and it actually wants to find a burrow. They're actually no nocturnal. I'd rather be in this dark burrow than in the light. And uh, in order to do that, it has to remember um, its spatial location, a former map in its brain. And uh, Jess was able to show that the Huntington's mice with environmental enrichment had a delayed onset of the cognitive deficits modeling dementia. So it's, it's affecting multiple aspects of the disease. Okay, so once we step into the area of psychiatric disorders and mental illness, modeling something as complex as depression in an animal is challenging, and we, we acknowledge that it's challenging. However, the one advantage we have with disorders like depression, schizophrenia, and anxiety disorders is that for some sufferers, there are drugs that are given that are beneficial, not always to everyone, but at least some sufferers, and depression's one of them. So uh, it's something we have pursued in mice, modeling that, and the reason we think these kind of tests are relevant to human depression uh, is because when you give a drug, like an antidepressant, like Prozac to the mice, it, it shifts the behavior in a way that suggests these behaviors are directly relevant to depression. And so, uh, as well as I mentioned, we're the first to show in an animal model of Huntington's that we could model a depression, which is one of the key features that occurs in about 50% of these Huntington's patients. Uh, it could be corrected with antidepressant drugs, but also with this environmental enrichment. And in fact, this is work done by Terence Pung and Thibaut Renoir followed it up to show that exercise or physical activity also had a beneficial effect, if you like, an antidepressant effect in these mice. So that's one of the, the areas we've gone, is to go from this complex environment to do other experiments. For, for example, you can just put running wheels in there, and the mice actually like to run. They seem to get an endorphin hit from them, and so they will run many kilometers a day. And so we can do an exercise intervention in the mice and have been able to show that, as I mentioned, Terence Pung, Thibaut Renoir, and others, able to show that exercise on its own has a benefit, but on balance, it seems that the combination of cognitive stimulation, physical activity, has the biggest benefit. And there's some human data. Um, well, actually, the, the Huntington's clinical work is uh, being attempted by uh, colleagues directly in response to translate this uh, mouse work. And, th and that's one of the things we're trying to do here is, is to translate this work. So I like showing this uh, slide because it, it shows the beauty of the brain and, and neurons. I mentioned 100 billion neurons. This is just a single neuron. I mentioned a thousand trillion synapses, these connections between them. So there is uh, an exquisite beauty to the brain and, and to neurons uh, underlying all of the complexity. And you can see here when you zoom in, uh, here's a single synapse or connection between two neurons. Imagine a thousand trillion of those within your brain. So this goes back to Ramon E. Cajal, who won a Nobel Prize over 100 years ago, um, doing very, very basic staining on uh, brain tissues. But we have more high-tech approaches uh, now. But still, this demonstrates that something like environmental enrichment, which is not only relevant to Huntington's, but other disorders like stroke and many other brain disorders, following environmental enrichment within the uh, brains of these rodents, more of these connections or synapses can be seen to form. So that's one of the things that happens with increased cognitive stimulation and physical activity. There are various other things that appear to happen in response to uh, exercise. We know, and that's part of what we're pursuing, is understanding the beneficial effects of things like cognitive stimulation physical activity. If we can understand it down to the level of molecules, then those molecules might be targets for drugs and other therapeutics. And so I'd propose that these would be environmentics. They would be therapeutic drugs or, or other um, therapies that mimic and or enhance the beneficial effects of cognitive stimulation physical activity. So there's potentially great benefit in pursuing these uh, effects right down to the level of individual molecules. And then if we can develop these environmentics, we can apply them to a whole range of brain disorders, not just Huntington's, but other disorders like uh, 
Alzheimer's disease and, and other forms of dementia. Okay, the third revolution now is epigenetics. Epigenetics really just means above the genome. So there's two analogies to understand epigenetics. I mentioned the three billion letters of DNA in your genome, in every cell in your body except red blood cells. So epigenetics is really modifications of the DNA of the genome. So think of an orchestra. Think of the 20,000 genes as being a 20,000 instruments uh, in the orchestra. And think of epigenetics as the musicians. And when you combine the instruments and the musicians, you get the symphony of life. The other way to think about it is think about uh, the 20,000 genes as, as words in a text. And uh, the epigenetics can be italics or bold. It can be different colored highlighter pens that ensure that a gene is either expressed a lot or expressed less. And that epigenetics varies in each cell of your body potentially. So I won't go into the complexities here, but think about these uh, chromosomes where your genes are packed into. And if we unwind the DNA, uh, you can see with various techniques the, the modifications of the DNA that constitute this epigenetics. And the important thing about this is that these environmental factors, that may be one way that they can impact on the brain and lead, for example, to uh, prevention or amelioration of brain disorder is via epigenetics. And that's one aspect that we're pursuing. So you can think of these environmental factors like stress or diet, behavior, environmental enrichment, physical activity, etc., might actually change expression by flipping an epigenetic switch on particular genes within particular cells in your brain and your body. So this is a slightly complex concept, but this goes right back to a pioneer in the field called Conrad Wadding Waddington. So what Waddington proposed, he used the term epigenetic landscape, and he was talking more generally about development, this extraordinary fact that if you take identical twins, the fact that they started two eggs that divide from a, a single fertilized egg, and they develop two identical uh, offspring, that they're in development, that evolution has produced uh, this genetics, this genome that ensures a certain reproducibility of development. So we've adapted this idea for brain development, but to think it as it goes down, rolls down the slope, uh, and this is the concept of epigenetics, is that a shift in environmental factors might shift the pathway of brain development. And this is an important concept we need to think about because as humans, we're really walking around with caveman genomes. The genome has hardly changed as far as we know in uh, thousands of years. So more or less, our brains and bodies are very similar to our hunter-gatherer hunter caveman ancestors. And so if you think about a human disorder, let's take, for example, autism spectrum disorder, where it appears that they're changing in incidence or prevalence, it's not the genes. You know, they don't change fast enough. It can't be a change in the genes. It's got to be a change in epigenetics, which could change the pathway of, of brain development via a number, either a shift in, in exposures in the environment or even uh, particular environmental factors like major stressors. And it could be in utero while the mother's pregnant, it could be postnatal. So another way to think of this is think of a pile of brains. Each of these brains, one of them could be yours, has been generated by a different genome. And so in a, what we call a bell curve, there can be abnormal brain development at the two extremes. So think about, as, as we know, genes and genomes evolve very slowly. So the, the average phenotype in a population of humans may not shift. But if in modern society where you're getting a shift in diet, in sedentary behavior and physical activity, in levels of stress, that uh, particularly with respect to development, that it could change the shape of this curve and it could produce more abnormal brain development 
at the extreme. So we've put forward this hypothesis that this could be a reason why uh, that autism spectrum disorder, for example, appears to have increased. Now, there are issues around diagnosis. Obviously, in some disorders, diagnosis changes over time. But uh, it's something we need to explore if a disorder is increasing. We need to understand these factors, including epigenetics, to try and uh, stop that increase and perhaps reverse it. This is a whole other area which I won't really have much time to go into, but this goes back, you're all familiar with Darwin, uh, but pe some people are less familiar with Lamarck, who Darwin was actually a big fan of. And Lamarck was ridiculed because of this idea of Lamarckian evolution where giraffes reached up to the highest leaves and therefore their offspring had longer necks and ha ha, it wasn't a fool. But it, it appears that aspects of Lamarck are not completely wrong in that your experience, not just as a, uh, a woman before she has a, a baby, but a man before he has offspring, this epigenetics might be encoded even in the males within their sperm and carry information to the next generation. This is something we've been exploring again in mice with Terence Pang, Annabelle Short, Shlomo Yasharin and others in recent years and the evidence of our work and other colleagues have been pursuing different approaches, is that certain factors such as um, the stress of the male mice, or stress hormone levels in the male mice, and physical activity before conception can change the behaviour of the offspring. So this has obviously major, major implications. Our colleagues in Australia actually did a study where they gave junk food to father rats before they had offspring and it produced changes relevant to diabetes and metabolic dysfunction. And therefore, the, the public health implications is, of this are huge. If you can imagine, not just through the, the maternal line, the mothers, but al also through the paternal line, that your lifestyle may actually be transmitted, not just to the next generation, but to grandchildren. The animal experiment suggests that it goes to what we call F2, which are the equivalent of grandchildren. And so what we have to be, consider is that this shift in lifestyles might, in theory, set up increased predisposition to particular disorders in the next generation. So it's an urgent priority to work out what is happening in humans. If this is happening, how do we stop these negative factors going to the next generation? And if they do go to the next generation, how we use this technology to diagnose this contribution uh, to, if you like, uh, epigenopathy, a disorder that has epigenetic foundations. I won't go into details here, but I mentioned we're trying to understand brain reserve right down to the level of uh, genes and, and proteins, not just at the level of the, the whole brain and the level of cells, but right, right down to the level of indi individual molecules. And so if we can understand that, these might be potential therapeutic targets, including drug targets. So the idea if you're more mentally active and physically active, you can build a reserve, a resilience in the brain, uh, this brain reserve, and that's something we're trying to understand and to utilise to improve brain health. So finally, I used to just say we're all dealt a genetic deck of cards of conception that we can do nothing about, which is true. It appears now we may also be dealt an epigenetic deck of cards at conception which we may be able to do something about because some of these epigenetic changes may be reversible, uh, whereas the DNA sequence is much harder to reverse. And so some individuals, because of their genetics and epigenetics, start to drift down this pathway of brain dysfunction, but this brain reserve and these positive environmental factors might be protective, and even those with a dysfunctional brain may be able to undergo functional compensation, and even those who develop a brain disorder would like to be able to develop new treatments, including environmentics, that would shift everyone over to this side of healthy brain function and ageing. And it's an extraordinarily complex puzzle. We're at very early stages. Uh, in terms of general messages, uh, in terms of how you interpret this, in terms of human data, we know that staying physically active is good, not just for your body, but for your brain. Staying cognitively stimulated is particularly good for your, your brain. 
Uh, healthy diet's good for the body and the brain. Managing stress is important for brain health. And uh, sleep is particularly important for the health of the body and the brain. So, sorry, he <laughs> it, it just gets onto every slide. He's like a... It's like a malicious virus. I don't know how he got onto that slide, but uh, that just summarises uh, some of these concepts. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge these wonderful people uh, who've worked with past and present uh, who've contributed to this research at the Florey Institute, and I'm happy to take uh, any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you.